morning, committee. Nice to see you all. It's the first time in the session. Thank you. Off to a good start. Okay. So I'm here to talk about H496 that was introduced last year in 2019. Um, this is an act relating to bias-motivated crimes and misconduct. And I think this is the first time the committee is taking it up this year. I think we went through it briefly last year. Right. Um, so it may look familiar to some of you. <clears throat> yep. So I'll be glad to uh, get started. So I'll just preface it by saying the first eight sections of this bill um, are amending existing law in the discrimination chapter and um, the hate crimes, injunctions against hate-motivated crimes chapter. And it's essentially just making some word tweaks. Um, so I think we're going to go through those pretty quickly. Uh, the ninth section is a new, um, is it would be a new section of law and with uh, associated civil penalties. So we'll spend a little bit more time once we get to the back of the bill. Has that been added since last year or that was on there? No, that was la this is as it was introduced last year. So section one, this is, we're starting in the discrimination chapter, um, which is chapter 31 in title 13. Um, and you'll see that what we've done on line nine is just add the word or bias. And you're gonna see this throughout. We've changed, um, we've either added the word bias or we've changed hate motivated to bias motivated throughout this chapter and the next chapter um, to provide that conduct that is uh, prohibited, that's motivated by bias as opposed to hate, is also prohibited. Um, so next change in section two, like I said, hate motivated is changed to bias motivated crimes. Um, and then it's also on line 18, we've removed um, the requirement that conduct be maliciously motivated. So a person who um, commits a crime and that conduct is motivated by the victim's actual or perceived race, color, religion, national origin, sex, ancestry, age, Service in, the, service in the U.S. Armed Forces or disability, sexual orientation, or gender identity is subject to these additional penalties on top of the penalties that are um, imposed because of the underlying crime that was committed. Um, yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, thank you. Brynn, the, the difference between hate motivated and bias motivated, I guess, uh, how, how could that be applied out in the, out in the real world, I guess? You know, how would... Uh, What's the difference between that, as far as charges go, that type of thing, I guess? I think that, I mean, the charge would be the same. I think the words, you know, the plain meaning of the words are what you really look at in a situation like this. So bias um, is different than hate because it means that um, it's motivated by a prejudice uh, against or for a particular person or group of people. Um, as opposed to hate, which um, sort of indicates that the conduct is more maliciously motivated, as as the statute says. So it may apply to sort of a broader. Um, yeah, just a follow-up question, to that because I'm sort of is this was the is the intent or was the intent of the of the um, uh, the people that introduced the bill is this a sort of a a language modernization thing, or were we finding hate difficult to prove, and so therefore putting bias in? I think it's the former. Um, that this okay. is it's an acknowledgement that this okay. conduct is not is can be uh, motivated by bias as opposed to actual hate. Gotcha. Thank you. But please correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think that changing the words hate to bias is the more substantive change. It's getting rid of maliciously is really the, the yeah. most critical part of the, right. what we're doing with this. Right, and that was going to be my question mm -hmm. talking about maliciously. Yes. Yeah. You're right. So that is a, that's a specific sort of element that the um, prosecutor would no longer have to prove, that that was a malicious motivation for the conduct. Makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, yeah. yeah. That it, I feel like we discussed malicious in another bill once, and it yeah, <coughs> makes sense to use it if we can. Okay. 
so thank you for that clarification. So the next section is section three. I'm on page three now. Um, we've moved to chapter 33, which is the following chapter. And this is the chapter that provides that um, there is civil relief um, for people who are victims of hate-motivated crimes. And again, we make the same changes here. Change hate-motivated to bias-motivated crime throughout uh, the definition section. And if you turn to page four, section four, throughout the commencement of action and hearing section. Page five is juvenile defendants. Um, just a technical change there on line 12. And then on page six, um, change, again, changing hate motivated to bias motivated. Um, same thing in section six. This is the relief section, what relief the court can order. Just changing those words throughout. Section seven, service. Same thing there. And section eight provides is a penalty section. Um, and we change the words there as well. So now I've gotten to section nine. This is a new section of law, um, violation of constitutional rights and the associated penalties. Um, so this statute is modeled after um, a similar statute in Massachusetts. Um, and I've, for the definition section, I've drawn on our, some language from our stalking statute, so some of it may look familiar to you. Um, so the first definition is repeated harassment or intimidation. So that means engaging purposefully in a course of conduct that's directed at a specific person um, that the person knows or should know would cause a reasonable person to fear for their safety or the safety of a family member. or the person who's undertaking the conduct should know, knows or should know, will cause a reasonable per person to suffer substantial emotional distress. And emotional distress can... I know it's been, the question's been asked before, but um, I don't really remember the answer. The, um, the conduct knows or should know. What does, I guess, what does should know mean? Um, should knows means that a reasonable, per reasonable person would know. That's Yep. <laughs> um, so I'll just keep going there. What substantial emotional distress is evidenced by significant modification in a person's routines, um, including moving from an established residence, changes to daily routines um, that cause serious disruption in a person's life. Or That's right out of stalking. That is um, pulled directly from the stalking statute. <coughs> Um, and then move on to the course of con definition of course of conduct, and this is important because um, course of conduct is in the repeated harassment or intimidation definition. So we're de we're separately defining that here. Again, this is this comes from the stalking statute. Two or more acts over a period of time, however short, in which a person harasses, intimidates, threatens, or makes threats about another person or interferes with another person's property. Um, and that applies to acts conducted by the person either directly or indirectly and by any action, method, device, or means. And we've got that all-important sentence there that constitutionally protected activity is not included in the definition of course of conduct. So that's sort of a, a way of, um, of saying this statute is not intended to get any activity that would fall under the First Amendment, the right to free speech. Um, period of time, line 10? Mm-hmm. That's either pretty narrow or pretty broad, potentially. I'm, I'm yes. not looking to change it up. Yep. Just, just, I guess, the definition of the practical sense, I guess. Yep. It just means, could be. Could be, right. It could, that, a court could interpret that to be as long as, yes, I think a court could make that interpretation on its own. And, just, um, you said this, that language comes out of another? Yep, the, that comes out of the, the, the existing stocking okay. statute. I don't remember why it was left in a period of time. I, you know. Again, I'm not looking to change it. I'm just looking for why, I guess, why it was left like that. 
I can follow up. Eric worked with this committee on the stocking statute. I think you did a sort of an, a, an overhaul two years ago right. of that statute. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't have that. Oh, did you? Okay, I thought you needed history. Okay. But um, I will. I can follow up with him and see if he remembers. Um, actually, Patrick and Barbara. Yeah, and I I might just be misunderstanding or something like that. But can you give me an example of a constitutionally protected activity that would also be harassment but not a problem? So there's constitutional, the, obviously this, the Constitution protects speech, um, but there are certain types of speech that are not constitutionally protected. And an example is the true threats. Mm -hmm. if, you, if a person knowingly places another person um, in fear for their safety, uh, that is typically considered a, an area of speech that is not constitutionally protected. Um, so by putting in the sentence that, you, that you're um, not going after constitutionally protected speech, it allows the court to say the legislature's intent was not to get at this activity that's constitutionally protected. And it will typically um, not undermine a statute on its face for um, being unconstitutional if you've got problematic, mm -hmm. but still be protected. Mm -hmm. Nazi demonstration, right? Yeah, I mean, is that what are we... I think yeah, there's a there's a there's a broad range of activity. Um, could be. I'm not sure. I'm the best person to talk about what would be problematic. But um, putting up flyers. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Definitely demonstrations. Mm -hmm. yeah. So would coach not to pick on you, but <laughs> so no, if I not. placed the Confederate flag on coach's front lawn, that would be considered harassment. Well, well, being that we're on the record, I won't say what might happen. <laughs> <laughs> so to me, that wouldn't be uh, uh, constitutionally covered, but a, it's directed at one at and it's right. private property. It, you know the right, right. Yeah. But, but if I carried a uh, Confederate flag at a rally, mm -hmm. that would be constitutionally covered. Or flew on your lawn. Or flew right. on my lawn. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, you're right you know, to do that, but not on my property. Right, you right, know? yeah. You know, it, it's, that's where the line gets crossed, you know, is when you do it directly to someone versus your shit, you know, this is, this is my thing, so to speak, and you have the right to do your thing <laughs> as long as you don't bring it to me. <laughs> you know, well, right. if that or in the record, clear. Right. I don't own one of those flags. <laughs> right. 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 like, no, no, I know. Like, recently, um, there were, you know, posters around Burlington. Yes. Or somewhere yeah. else that said, you know, it's okay to be anti-Semitic. Yes. Right. Yeah. Or that's something weird. white, too. Yeah. yeah. Right. But, um, I saw a bunch of answers. Mm -hmm. Barbara Ken, Martin. Um, so one thing I'm wondering is, do we ever define reasonable person? Because I know um, when Tom asked about it, I feel like frequently there's discussion about, well, what if we have two diametrically opposed um, views and we're both reasonable people? Like, how do we, or how does the court look at reasonable person? Um, the court looks at it in terms of the um, circumstances. So how would a person, your average person, respond in this particular set of circumstances? And we don't typically define it because we don't right. necessarily want it to vary between one statute and another. And I'm thinking of, this is sort of a silly analogy, but like whatever that game show is, that's like our studio audience said, and it's like you usually have very diff different views that, you know, maybe two or three views that a large group of people have. So, yeah. I, Are you thinking about it in the context of whether or not a reasonable person would be placed in fear, or? Um, well, I know we got into that with stalking quite a bit. So yes, it could be that, or um, a reasonable person is offended by it, where, uh, a court might say, well, that's silly. You know, like, I just want to make sure that it doesn't give enough latitude for a... Right, and I think because the, um, 
what a reasonable person has to be put in is a pretty objective standard. Like if, if the person has to be put in fear or the person has to be um, suffer substantial emotional distress, but you, you talk about what that means specifically. If a reasonable person would change their, the way they drive to work or change where they're living. Um, those are pretty objective um, circumstances. Okay. As opposed to whether or not a reasonable person would um, feel a certain way about something. Feel right. Like. Okay. And I know there's that like eggshell skull kind of mm -hmm. um, category of people like, okay, they're super sensitive or, mm -hmm. you know, it causes them to have a heart attack or, you know what I mean? Right. Where That's in tort law, though. So, okay. So yeah. that doesn't, okay. Right. Thanks. So uh, Barbara uh, brought up a good question that I had, but also, um, how do you define what a reasonable person is nowadays? Well, again, it's the, it's the court's interpretation. The court sort of m makes um, mm -hmm. m makes a determination about whether or not a, um, a person, the, an average person, would feel a certain way under those set of circumstances. So I'm not sure that the court actually uses a definition of what a reasonable person is. Um, it's it's just sort of a framework for thinking about whether or not um, it was appropriate for the victim to feel a certain way under a certain set of cir circumstances. I got one more. So uh, my original uh, my original question was: Don't we already have a lot of these laws already in place? Or a lot of this format already in place has just been ex expanded as the world changes or, or as society changes what's allowed and what's not? Or how it's looked at now compared to in the past? Because I, I, I'm honestly not experienced in this area much at all. I, thank God I've never really uh, been exposed that much to it. So I've you know, talked to call. I, I need to talk to call. But you're also, in terms of a question for... Right. Um, right, yeah, I'm sorry. Can you, can you yeah, so this, yeah. this is different than um, sort of the stalking statute or uh, other sort of statutes we have because it provides different relief. So we haven't gotten to that section yet, but it's a, it provides for a civil penalty. So it... Um, that's something that we don't have that doesn't exist currently in Vermont statute. That it gives a person a remedy of um, seeking a civil injunction against a person who's harassing them, and also it allows them to go after damages um, if they can prove the elements of the pro prohibited conduct. But if I understand your point, is that, um, that the, the question is: Is the law changing or evolving because our clients are changing and yes. evolving? Yes. We need to have responses. Um, yes, I think that was a good. Seeking justice. Mm -hmm. Some of us. So, I guess one of the things that, uh, well, there, there's two things, and, and I'll wait until the the uh, uh, the penalty portion uh, to discuss, uh, you know, that. But when we think about, you know, bias motivated. Uh, uh, incidences. What is real scary is when it's at the juvenile level uh, and what people experience almost daily. Uh, and in one of my other lives, uh, one of my colleagues came to me and said, Coach, you wouldn't believe what I heard on the bus. And it was kids, you know, using the N-word. And one kid on the bus took it really hard. The other kids that were involved in this, this little mel melee um, said that they were just quoting rap music. So <coughs> for an administrator, you know, it's easy for the bus driver to say, look, I'm stopping the bus. You guys either, you know, stop this behavior or, or whatever. You know, you can stop that piece. But when you get to the reporting part to the school administrator, and the school administrator looks at the film, because, you know, all of the buses have cameras now, you know, looks at the film, 
and goes, oh my God, how do I separate, you know, what's really going on here? Because it becomes really difficult. Um, but with this, hopefully, after you do your investigation, you know, as a school administrator, because you're required to by law, you will come up with more findings because we will give them more tools to work with, okay? Because right now, the kid could very easily just say, yeah, I was listening to some I was just, and that would be it. Now, with, if we are able to get uh, this through, and it's not so much what happens on the other end, it's more the, the learning piece, you know, that, that goes on people will have more tools to work through the problem. You know, and that's what this is really about. Well, just getting back to the original uh, question that Patrick had as far as the constitutional rights that are involved, mm -hmm. certainly the one we're talking about in section uh, two, that constitutionally protected activity is not included within the meaning of the course of conduct, and really focuses on uh, free speech rights. But but then we're also talking about uh, protecting an individual's uh, exercise of enjoyment of any right or privileges under the Constitution. And, I mean, you can, and it includes the Vermont Constitution. And the Vermont Constitution, for instance, uh, in Article 1 protects uh, that individuals have the right to liberty, acquiring, possession, protecting property, pursuing safety, uh, which we also kind of capture the suffering, substantial emotional distress in 1B. And there's right to religion, there's you know, free exercise of religion, free speech. There's a lot of rights that are enumerated in the Vermont Constitution as well as the federal constitution. So, so it ultimately, though, I think it becomes a battle of protecting those rights of the victim and then, of course, the free speech rights of perpetrator potential. So I don't know if that helps, but that's kind of what the intention of uh, those provisions in there were. So. And also a reasonable person, as long as we're not looking in DC, it's pretty easy to establish the reasonable person. <laughs> Okay, so I'll move on to the violation section. I'm at the bottom of page nine now, subsection B. So this is the uh, prohibited conduct. No person shall, through repeated harassment or intimidation, that's the definition we just went through, willfully injure, interfere with, or attempt to injure or interfere with, or oppress or threaten any other person in the free exercise or enjoyment of any right or privilege secured to that person through the Vermont Constitution. Um, or the laws of Vermont, or the Constitution or laws of the United States. So, um, importantly, we've got the uh, mens rea element there of willfulness. So the conduct has to be intentional conduct. Um, so I'll move on to the penalty section. Um, a person who's injured as a result of a violation of this new section uh, has a private right of action in Superior Court for injunctive release arising out of the violation. Um, and for each violation, a civil penalty of not more than $5,000 plus reasonable costs and attorney's fees. Also provides in subsection D that um, a person can get a protective order if they can prove by a preponderance of the evidence that the defendant did violate the section. And then subdivision two there talks about how relief is granted for a fixed period um, and the court can extend the order at the expiration of it, of the original order. Um, for time that it deems necessary to protect the plaintiff or the plaintiff's children. Um, and all of this language is lifted directly from the section on injunctions against hate motivated crimes, um, the relief section where you can get a protective order there as well. So that's all the same kind of, uh, same kind of requirements for the protective order. Um, and private right of action, um, can we discuss that because I'm not sure if it's spoken of Right, so the, yep, yes, so you talked about that a little bit last year with the abortion bill. Um, there are places in our statute that provide that a person has can bring an action um, on their own without uh, the attorney general, for example, representing them. 
um, for civil relief in Superior Court. Um, so the, there's cons in our consumer protection laws, we have a few places where you can have a private right of action. Again, the abortion bill provides for um, the the new abortion law provides for a private right of action, um, and so that's here as well. So the idea is that in cases where, well, I just want to make sure a couple of things. If the AG's office is representing them. It's probably not in a civil matter, um, right? There, there are there can be places where the attorney general would would um, would represent a person in a civil matter, but it would have to be specific, specifically set forth. So this does not provide that the attorney general would go after somebody. So anyone who wants to take advantage of this either has to represent themselves or get an attorney and go through the process, right? And I heard you say, and I was looking for it, if the person is found guilty, they can get court costs back? Yes. Okay, because that's one of the things I'm thinking of. It's usually... Court costs and attorney's fees. Okay. And I'm assuming there are attorneys that will take a case. Well, I don't know. Will they take a case? Because what could happen is, right, like they have to put the money out first mm -hmm. and they're not able to use this law. Right. I, there are, my understanding is that there are attorneys in practice who will take a case um, without being paid until um, relief is awarded. And obviously they have to think it's a case that they're going to win. Right. Thanks. I had one question. So aside from changing the, the wording from hate motivated to bias motivated, does this have any other effect on the criminal path? Right, yes, um, I, we've taken out the word maliciously. Um, so in the hate crime statute, um, it kind of removes that element that the conduct has to be maliciously motivated um, and just provides that it has to be motivated by the person's um, protected status. So, uh, to, oh, I'm sorry. So the Tate and others, uh, uh, representative of ours seems, uh, uh, point a little further. So in the criminal side, um, both can still be used as far as uh, hate, hate or bias. Right. Um, I think that bias is um, would sort of encompass hate. I, okay. I think that my interpretation, maybe it might be better to talk to a prosecutor about mm -hmm. this, but because bias is sort of a lower standard than hate, okay. it, it is necessarily included. Just a, it, uh, yeah. just a quick point. Uh, in thinking about the, the, that little uh, example I gave of the, the school bus, um, I, I do drive spare school bus, so I, I run into a lot of uh, <laughs> situations with folks. And uh, so a lot of my colleagues will, you know, like ask questions. What do you do with this? And what do you do with that? And I really believe that the adults in the room need tools, and but then again, we need to let them know what the tools are that they have to use. But when we look at a reasonable person, most people are, you know, fairly reasonable. You know, I, I'm giving. A, you know, I'm going there. <laughs> you know, right? You know, I, I'm, I'm going there. <laughs> Or we would hope, you know, that, that they are. Um, and so, you know, taking that as the, you know, let's say as a first step, uh, you start to wonder, you know, where does this come from? You know, because when you talk to the kids, 
some would never even go there, whereas others feel it's okay to go there. And so you say, the, you know, the, the question you ask is, why is it okay? And, and what in your uh, sensibility makes you think that that's okay to go there, you know, to hurt another student, let's say. And, and it can be on any topic because, you know, it's, it's all of the protected classes, let's say, you know. And you see that, you know, like happening. And, and, and some people do it just for, you know, the uh, attention. Uh, some people do it because it's bias motivated. And it's a bias usually that is established somewhere. You know, it goes deeper than just, you know, something they heard on TV or uh, something along that line. And then it's a little sad when you start to get into it in depth. It goes back to the family. And, you know, that's, that, that's that discussion that people have a hard time having sometimes. But when you're, let's say, a school administrator and you bring the parents in to start to do the investigation after you've met with the student, and then it becomes eminently clear where that behavior came from. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's why you see and you hear from constituents uh, reports of not feeling that they were treated well you know, in a school setting um, over a discipline issue. And usually when it's something that is uh, related to, you know, these types of issues, that's where people, uh, you know, start to split, you know, that line pretty quickly. Um, so anyways, that, that's a lot of what the, you know, the background piece of this is. And, you know, as you talk to more people, you hear more stories. And, and, and so having tools that, that help us in any of those settings, and it could be just about anywhere, you know, uh, that, that it can occur, uh, and especially if we're in the, any of the helping fields, you know, you're going to see it, um, and, or service fields. Right. Anything with the public. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, and so it becomes pretty, uh, uh, pretty important um, to make sure that people understand that some things just aren't right and aren't cool, you know, to do to each other. So, anyways, that's kind of the background. Thank you. So, Brenda, are you good on, on time? I was going to yeah, ask. There's no, there's no rush. Okay, so I'm going to to David just to continue on the legal. Yes, please. Okay, great. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> Jeez, we're going to have to give you frequent flyer in the mic or something. I do help myself to your camera. Yeah, oh, okay. That's right. That's right. Is it a pro quo though? Right. I don't know if I'd call it that. Okay. All right. Yeah. 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 Just making sure. <laughs> um, David Chair with the Attorney General's Office. Uh, so, a couple things. I wanted to state up front the Attorney General's support for the goals behind this bill. Uh, absolutely supports what is motivating this bill, which is to protect people who need protecting and uh, for whom our current system doesn't always work and the people who are subject to these incidents don't always feel protected, often don't feel protected by, um, by the folks who are supposed to be helping them, which includes people in government like our office. Uh, so I want to be clear on that. I also want to be clear that I am not my office's foremost expert on these issues and um, I, well, I, I I'm happy to entertain some questions and give answers where I feel comfortable doing so. Julio Thompson is really a true expert on these issues. He has national uh, insight into what's going on around the country, and I, so I will, and I apologize, but I will defer some of those answers to somebody who's going to be more useful to the committee and has a lot more expertise than I do on this stuff. So I just want to be upfront about that as well. But I can give you that clear policy statement. We support the goals of this bill, and we will get our best expert, and he's very good, yeah, into the committee to uh, answer more detail-oriented questions about the constitutional balance of some of these measures, um, and he can tell you a lot about what other states and jurisdictions are doing with this. So, 
Uh, maybe it might be uh, helpful if you could share with the rest of the committee some of the work that the AG's office has been doing, at least with the uh, uh, with the database for uh, bias crimes. Sure. So one. Reporting. Yeah, and so one of the things that committee members have probably may have heard about. Um, is a bias incident reporting system, which uh, is a fancy name for what is effectively a phone tree, but an important phone tree, a phone tree that needs to be uh, established and where the calls need to be made. And the idea basically is making it clear that incidents that involve bias, whether or not they rise to the level of a crime, are being reported up to our office. Uh, and vice versa, our office, when we hear about things, reporting things down to local jurisdictions. Um, in the past, we've found it often is the case that a local officer may encounter some incident. Uh, there's pretty clearly some bias behind it. It may be as obvious as a uh, racial slur or r religious uh, slur, and it doesn't, you know, the officer assesses it, doesn't correctly, maybe, assesses that it doesn't rise to the level of a crime, and says, well, that's that, you know, no police action here, we're done. And what we're really trying to do is say, for all those incidents, um, the agent's <coughs> office needs to hear about it so that we can ensure that other, that we can uh, assess whether we can do something about it and so that we can make sure that other authorities around the state um, are hearing about that as well. So that may include the uh, Human Rights Commission, certainly will include the Human Rights Commission in many cases. Uh, it may include the federal government as well. Uh, the Vermont U.S. Attorney's Office. And that's because those offices all have powers to enforce that go beyond criminal enforcement. So even though local officer, local state's attorney may not feel like they have jurisdiction because there's no crime, um, there are civil enforcement actions that can be taken either by our office, by the Human Rights Commission, or by the U.S. Attorney's Office. So that's a really important system, and it's not just reporting up, but also you know reporting to each other, making sure that we are hearing about what you're hearing about, where that's appropriate. That may not always be appropriate, but where that's appropriate. Um, and just making sure that there's good communication as part of that, certainly um, tracking what we're hearing. Um, the FBI's statistics on hate crimes uh, may not be complete because reporting isn't mandatory on those issues and so just making sure we have our own um, understanding of what's happening in the state is important so that was maybe a longer winded answer but hopefully but I, th I, I, I think that's helpful you know in everyone's understanding of you know how uh, important not not just how important it is but uh, how we have an opportunity probably is the best way to put it to try to mitigate those instances in our own state, you know, and and sometimes you just have to take control of the of the beast because that's that's what it is, and you know the, the one of the driving pieces here too is with that communication. Sometimes what you find out is is that a particular incident, although it, as as uh, uh, David said it might not rise to the AG's jurisdiction but it might cross into let's say the Human Rights Commission's jurisdiction where because they don't have jurisdiction over housing we have jurisdiction over housing and a particular incident might have affected my ability to stay in a certain community, that affects my housing, you know? And that's, that's my right to be able to live where I wanna live. And you're infringing on my right to live, you know, there. And if I can pay for it and do all of those things, I should be able to live there, okay? And if I'm being mistreated, there are laws to mitigate that. So anyways, that communication is really critical. And, and that goes, holds true for all of the protected classes. Because what you start to see in some of these cases is, is that, you know, pe weird people are usually equal opportunity weird people. You know, so, and I use that term 
to kind of identify a group of folks that uh, are bias motivated and they'll they'll pick on anybody, you know, just out of spite. But. So the the database sounds great. I'm wondering how people know to contact it. So. For example, Parallel Justice Commission. So I'm assuming, because there are cases that we've heard where it's not, it's actually law enforcement saying or the systems being the ones that are making people feel uncomfortable. And so I, I'm just wondering how, like, can a citizen call up and say, this just happened to me, or they really need to go through some channel? Um, no, they should not feel like they have to go through any particular <laughs> okay. channel. But I also think that you're raising a really good point, and I don't, I'll say plainly, I don't think that we in government have done as well as we could in terms of getting that message out there, that uh, you don't have to go through any particular channel. Right. Call the AG's office directly, call the Human Rights Commission directly. Uh, maybe you do have, uh, somebody you feel comfortable with in, the, in your town or county authority structure, um, call any of those people. And the idea here is that there will be communication within, um, sort of on the inside, to make sure that the right people are dealing with the issue. Um, but I do think we need to do better in terms of getting the message out there. So are there materials that your office has or can generate? Like, because we're always passing on, like, here's some free tax help or here's this resource, and it just seems like a really important one for us to help with. Yeah, I agree, and I, so this is Julia <laughs> Thompson, Sorry, yeah, Thompson okay. will be able to answer this better. I know we did develop some stuff a couple years ago, or a year and a half ago maybe, um, that was intended to be distributed to law enforcement around the state. I don't know the status of that, that was more civil rights sure. units project. Um, but yes, there have been efforts to try to okay. get that information out there, and one thing that we've really found when we've done our forums around the state on these issues, on issues of bias incidents, is that there are often local entities, like nonprofit entities, not always government entities, right. where people do feel comfortable. And I think one of the lessons that we've taken from that, and that I think all sort of government actors should take from that, is work with the leadership of those entities because they may be in contact with folks who aren't comfortable going to authorities, but often the leadership of those places are people who are more comfortable. And are they contacting you with that data? Um, I, again, Julio will be a right, better because able it, to answer Again, that. that's a great point, is like making sure. But yeah, having those sort of intermediaries where sure. it may be that the folks at the um, top of those organizations are more comfortable moving in those worlds and can be a, a go-between, a bridge. Um, including and right front and center on the Vermont.gov page or something. You know? Yeah, that's a that's a good idea. I think that's a problem. That's an issue that is real, and we need to work on. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. And, and I and I think that sometimes, you know, uh, and and I think we've all sensed that the you can hear testimony on something like this, and all of a sudden you go, oh my goodness, you know, how, how can we do it better? You know, or or not so much better. How can we get that word out? Uh, I, I remember hearing uh, testimony about the uh, uh, our advocate, uh, uh, our medical advocate, and they got you know recognition this morning. And um, I don't know how many calls uh, you get from constituents about healthcare. So to be able to now, you know, at, this was your, a couple of years ago after I heard, you know, from uh, Mike, now you had a point of reference that you could refer right. your constituents to and kind of pass the word. If you do have a problem, these guys will step up, and they do, you know, in the advocate's office. So, but anyways. So thanks. Um, it would be great if we as a committee could, could get a link or something that mm -hmm. we could. Use, whether sure. it's front porch forum yeah. or right. you know, in yeah. our own yeah. communities or networks, whatever. That makes sense, I'm just yeah. noting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that actually is something that Mike Fisher yeah. said to all of us. Yeah. Right. An email with you know contact information and 
Definitely. That makes a lot of sense. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. I'm a lot, Hi, less a lot less nervous than I was like two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> good to see you. How you doing, Brent? Thank you. Uh, good to see you all, too. Uh, for the record, Brenda Churchill with the LGBTQI Alliance of Vermont. And I wanted to pick up on a theme that I heard when I was listening to the legal uh, definitions. And Barbara, I just sent you a memo that oh. came from uh, uh, Captain Scott, who I had a good conversation with yesterday about the reporting and the incidences and, and what's going on. And since part of my testimony, but I'm kind of going to jump around here. Um, one of the things that occurred to me um, when I was driving down here that isn't in my testimony is, let's say I'm, uh, I've am i been a victim of, of being harassed or somebody in my community has. Uh, what's the mechanism that they can go to? Now, the Pride Center is obvious. You know, they get calls all the time, so they get referred into the system. But I have to realize that it is me that's going to be filling out the complaint. It's me that's going to uh, go into court. It's me who may be representing myself because as a protected class of folks or a marginalized community, I might not make enough money to hire a lawyer. And I can't find the, the uh, pro bono attorneys uh, that may be out there, or I don't have the resources to do so. And then I'm sitting across from my accuser, uh, or, or my well, the perpetrator of the crime to me. And that's a pretty intimidating circumstance. I don't think there's a lot of people in my community that would feel really comfortable doing that without an advocate or, or somebody going with them. And that just came into my my thought process this morning. And was an aside. Um, I'm gonna just skip the uh, recap of who the representative who I represent, but it is a consortium of. Uh, now six LGBTQ uh, mission-driven alliances in, in within the within the state of Vermont. Um, in preparing for my testimony today, I spoke with members of my community. I spoke with Bor Yang. I spoke with Captain Gary Scott and uh, former Representative Kai <coughs> Morris. I did so that I might gain some more insight and have a broader view of what has uh, led to seeing this bill brought to the House floor and hopefully to the governor's desk to be signed. Uh, when introduced, the Vermont Coalition for Ethnic and Social Equity in Schools sent a letter to ask folks to uh, uh, make sure that we joined in the discussion, at, at least from the standpoint of, of who stakeholders were for uh, putting this law forth. Um, I'm not sure that I am aware of who those people were or if there was ever an inclusion uh, within the context of the committee. Uh, to make sure that our voices were heard. But overall, I think with the reviews, both the legal reviews and the thoughts of uh, Mr. Chair, um, I think I've got a pretty good idea that it's, 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 o it's okay. Um, personally, I've been witness to hate speech that I hope you never have to have directed at you or a family member. My friend Christine Hawkwist stood up to a relentless stream of hate mail, hate speech, and direct confrontation every day of her campaign and for a long time after. Uh, threats on her life, her family, her campaign staff were a rea reality that we had to move past. I want you to know that she read everything that was addressed to her by email or in letters. She was extremely motivated to move beyond the hate and actually seemed energized by the vitriol that we all witnessed. Our friend, uh, former Representative Morris, a Judiciary Committee member, has also been the target of hate speech and it has affected her life and her family as well. I do not need to go over the well-known and publicized details of how that story continues to unfold. Both of these people, uh, Christine and Kaya, are extraordinary humans. They continue to show us how to move past the ugly underbelly of our current society. Both of these people who I call friends have been deeply, tragically, and continuously assaulted by others whose sole motivation seems to be the disruption of lives of people who are different than they are. According to statistics provided to me by uh, Captain Scott and the Vermont State Police, we are seeing an increase in the hate and biased motivated crimes being reported. And to the point, um, it is uh, awareness and training and community building that law enforcement officers receive, they're likely to bring those statistics up because now people are reporting them. And they are meeting a threshold of, of bias, but they may not be criminalized or uh, in violation of the law per se. Um, this, this really is probably the crux of this, is, is that the training that the Vermont State Police has instituted, I'm part of the um, uh, Fair and Impartial Policing Board, 
So I hear all this and the statistics are fresh and, and it, is, it is really encouraging in a bad sort of way that there is now more reporting being done because people are, officers, law enforcement officers, particularly the Vermont State Police are aware of what they're looking at. And as that trickles down to other departments and other law enforcement agencies, we may indeed see, see this as an increase uh, in uh, uh, both reporting and, and actuality. Um, with the change in language and the addition of civil penalties, H-496 now has what, is, what it seems to have been lacking. Um, the, I'd ask the committee to consider an addition to the penalty part of this act to include a diversion program, if possible, uh, so that um, uh, the, the community, the, the offenders can be accountable to the community and a way to help restore offenders in a way that allows the courts to have greater latitude and, and closure. In closing, I'd like to say that this bill goes in the right direction. This time really has come to show unity and support for anyone that is the victim of this level of bias and hatred. All marginalized communities deserve protection. The LGBTQIA Alliance of Vermont supports this legislation. Thank you. Yeah, I'd certainly like to understand a little bit more of what your uh, conception of the diversion program that you suggested. Thanks. Um, basically, it, there's currently um, a diversion program that exists uh, for folks who uh, have either minor offenses or offenses that don't rise to, uh, um, well, maybe even do rise to rather serious crimes that allow them to make reparations to the individuals and in their communities. Um, I'm not super well versed in that, but I, I have known people that have participated in uh, local uh, boards that have uh, brought people back to the community in a way that is meaningful to both the community and the individual. So I'd, I'd actually not answer the question as fully as I might if I, I knew it, but it's a good question. Uh, yeah, I guess I, yeah, I was just trying to understand. I would think, and we can hear from the state's attorneys and the agents as well, that the criminal portion that we have in here changed its bias, motivated crimes and such, that diversion is already an option. I mean, that's available there. Yeah, I would hope that the, the judges in, uh, across the state would have that uh, latitude to bring mm -hmm. people to a different or an alternative thing, especially if it's a first offense or in the case coach of minors that may be involved in uh, in that. I, I think those are, are really better alternatives than enacting civil penalties where maybe people can't pay anyway. Uh, right, so, yeah, so, so you're speaking, yeah, I guess you're, you're addressing more the, the last bit of the provision. Yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah, because the diversion is really more of the criminal context from what I understand. We can certainly... Well, it could be. Uh, it, it could be, but uh, let, let's uh, just, you know, say that maybe that isn't what fits best uh, in that case. If we're not, if they're looking at a civil thing, I might say, well, I'd like the person to apologize publicly. Mm -hmm. I'd like them to, to maybe do some community service work. I'd like them to mm -hmm. join a pride center uh, for a few meetings and, and get to know the folks that they were harming. Um, a lot of these things are, I'm sure, wrought from ignorance, uh, and education uh, can overcome that. Sure, I, I, I agree with that. It's just a matter of trying to, to fit that kind of thing into the penalty provision for a civil action. I'm not sure, but I'll, I'll ask the state's attorneys about that. They so, ponder this and look into it. So, Martin. Um, oh, I'm sorry. So um, I think what you're talking about might be um, the restorative justice programs would probably right. be a great yeah. vehicle for that. And um, right, I, I don't know how, mm -hmm. I know that a lot of them are busy and we want to make sure that they have the right um, training and tools to be effective. I also, um, so I, I like that idea because it really does seem like it's going to be more beneficial to just giving someone a fee, a fine, or incarcerating them, which made me wonder about people who are incarcerated who are experiencing this information and making sure somehow that the um, prisoners' rights group is, again, actively providing that information to prisoners. 
I also wonder if it would make sense to have like some kit that people get that would say, here are lawyers that are willing to take these cases or other information so that it makes it as easy as possible for people right. to yeah. go forward or yeah I I, it's, I appreciate your point about it being both intimidating and expensive. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea um, and I know that the Pride Center does offer uh, legal counsel uh, to people and there have several lawyers that uh, are not just on staff or not on staff but are part of their board of directors and many times we stop short with saying, oh, let's put a package together that would, would help this because we don't see it every day. Yeah. But sometimes we do see it every day and sometimes people just aren't aware uh, that there's resources or, or places to go or people available uh, to seek that recourse. I think education on all levels within the community, within my community and the resources that exist now would be a really good idea. Thank you. I'm sorry. Well, uh, to Martin's uh, uh, point about uh, civil versus criminal, and uh, I was thinking the same thing as uh, Barbara, uh, as far as restorative justice. Uh, we use that as a discipline model in schools now. Uh, not all schools are doing it. Uh, but at the, uh, the last school boards association conference, uh, we had uh, several school districts bring their model for restorative discipline to the conference. So we're doing that um, at, let's say, the education level. And it's been incredible having students involved in that process because they're learning a different way to deal with everything. Uh, so it would make sense to me if there is a way uh, for us to uh, embody that as another part of the continuum of uh, options, you know, that are available uh, for discipline <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and education, basically. It uh, makes sense to me. But uh, to your point, name it. Name yeah. it in the, no, in the document. Right. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's so, possible. You know, got to figure out how to do that. Your comment on, on this. Um, the, the purpose, one of the purposes for this provision, in the last provision we've been talking about, the protection against harassment, essentially, um, is a situation where somebody is running into these problems and and you don't find that you have, uh, you get appropriate, from your perspective, uh, relief from, from law enforcement. Because it could be, because the criminal uh, side of hate crimes, bias motivated crimes, etc., it's a much higher uh, bar to, to hold somebody criminally liable. Uh, there's also tighter restrictions as far as what behavior can constitute a crime. Uh, you run into constitutional problems and the fact that it has to be a, a true threat for, for a certain kind of harassment to raise to the level of a criminal um, offense. So this is put in here to try to give an additional avenue for an individual who's faced this kind of harassment and nothing happens in the criminal justice system. Uh, and we also specifically put in the reasonable attorney's fees and costs to try to, because I understand going to court as a pro se plaintiff is difficult. We can't really, in a civil action, offer your uh, attorneys to really anybody. Just not, that's not something that the state can fund. But putting that in is, is intended to hopefully be able to get somebody to help in this civil context. So, you know, so that's the concept behind that. I mean, and I guess if you could comment on whether this is valuable uh, to the community, having that separate avenue to try to get some uh, get some justice outside of the criminal justice system. That's a, that's a great question. Um, my thought goes to both the, the victim and the perpetrator and the socioeconomic spectrum that we're looking at within the context of our state um, and not anybody else out of here. but. Um, Let's just say that's not realistic. Isn't, isn't the judge a lawyer? Can he offer 
a different um, uh, path, uh, restorative justice being one of them, um, some sort of diversion that, that allows for no lawyers or money involved, but yet provides a, an answer or solution uh, without the added cost or burden of having to go to court and prove all that. Maybe it's it's very simple or very cut and dried. I, I know that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple, of, and again, we'll get some attorneys to weigh in on this. Uh, but I, I think there's injunctive relief is available. It's possible the court, you know, I'd like to understand from the court or from attorneys who are dealing with this more directly, uh, what kind of injunctive relief could be offered. If, but there's certainly when there's a civil lawsuit brought, there's an opportunity for settlement as well. And, and certainly in the settlement context, it could be that we're going to go to restorative justice. Or, but I'd like to, you know, we'll certainly look for testimony from some folks who are in the court system sure. on that. I, you know, I don't know if we're going to change or disincent behavior through this law. I think we're still going to see mm. these crimes uh, both reported and perhaps even on the rise given the current climate. I'd love to see something that, that may gave people a heads up saying, you know, if you do this, you're screwed or this could happen. But there's no, no way to put it ahead of when this crime happens. It all comes afterwards. Yeah, this is really, I think, centered on, on giving the victim. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in that context, yeah, this works. As well. right. But I understand what you're saying, yeah. and, and we'll, we'll, I'll certainly ask those questions. I'm sure others will ask those questions when we get other mm -hmm. witnesses. Appreciate it. So, so, so I guess as we look at that uh, uh, spectrum of uh, witnesses, we might want to have the Vermont Bar um, uh, come in. Uh, I carry a bunch of these cards with me uh, because every once in a while you run into a situation where a constituent, you know, has a problem, and you're not offering legal, you know, advice. You know, you just say, "Look, it would be handy if you speak to a lawyer," and and they have this system, you know, and uh, uh, they do a lot of pro bono work. Uh, and you know it's kind of the Vermont way. So and, and I'm I'm proud of the fact that our bar association, you know, like has this, you know, this tool, you know, for Vermonters who don't have another way, uh, and they kind of feel up against it, and then this can kind of help. So that goes back to that thing that Barb brought up about the kit, you mm -hmm. know, and I and I think. That's one of the things that it, it's nothing we can put in a bill or anything else, but it's it's one of those recommendation things, you know, to our advocates as far as their pages go, you know, they, they need to kind of build in to that um, that capability, what to do with, you know, um, and and what the options are and resources are. Uh, I think that's how, if we just say it. And call it out, you know. It might be helpful, you know, because I, I know I'm going to mention it to a few of the other groups we've been working with. I like that idea. We get to join forces now. <laughs> Happy to sit down with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was wondering if, Brent can, if you're able to weigh in on the concept of how we can fit uh, an avenue towards restorative justice in the section we were talking about. Yeah, so you, I think you were right to, to say that typically our restorative justice practices are in the context of crimes and criminal justice, but um, I don't think that means that you couldn't come up with a, uh, an idea about uh, funneling people who commit violation of this new section or maybe the hate crime section to a restorative justice center, um, and you could broaden their jurisdiction to hear um, or to to interact with and treat offenders of that statute. So it would be more of looking at the statute with, with respect to the extent of what restorative justice can do as opposed to something in here? I think both. Both, both. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think on the, on, am I right that on the criminal side of this, that avenue is already there? Yes, that is correct. Right. Um, and in fact, we automatically divert, uh, as you know, we automatically divert young people. Mm -hmm. Right. 
yeah. to the family division as opposed okay. to criminal court. We also have automatic diversion statutes um, yeah. for young people elsewhere. Yeah. So it'd be great to get restorative justice in. Yeah. 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 Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Good, Good to see you, Ben. Do we have a list of who's coming later? Um, we do. So we have um, Cor Yang from the Race Commission, Susanna Davis, Director of Racial Equity, Mark Hughes, Coordinator of Racial Justice Alliance, and then I believe Kaya has or will submit written um, testimony. So that's that's what I have here. Great. We're starting back at one? Yes.